So again, like I said, thank you for the prayer. We're gonna move forward in this presentation called Lucifer Fallen. And it's dealing with the subject of a being that was by default holy and pure. His name was Lucifer. Well, of course, he was by creation a son of God. He, being created, knew that there were other sons of God. But there was one that was specifically called the Son of God as well, and he was a little bit jealous of that Son of God because that Son of God received worship, and he didn't. As a Son of God. You're a Son of God, I'm a Son of God, you're getting worship, I'm not. What's the difference? Why so? And so what happens is, this Son of God thinks he should be like the Most High, like he is, the other son of God, but he can't be. He doesn't get worship, and he starts becoming jealous of the son of God that was begotten compared to being the son of God that was created. You see how that works? And so what we have here is this experience in the Bible of a being that was holy and pure, coming to an understanding that was contrary to his creator's will or spirit or mind or character or desires. All those things it was contrary to and Lucifer ends up becoming Satan. Now, Satan, we know that name, right? The same name as the devil and Satan, that old dragon, the serpent like it says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. We'll see that actually later as well. So we're going to go to our first scripture. It's in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 12. But it says son of man, right? Well, who is the son of man more credentialed than Ezekiel? What's his name in the Bible? Son of man? Yes, Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus Christ is called Son of Man many times. In fact, what's interesting is he refers to himself as the Son of Man. He doesn't say I, he says the Son of Man shall. Or the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Instead of saying I, 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 he refers to himself in the grammatical third person. That's an interesting subject if you wanted to check that out. That doesn't answer every question, but it sure fits in. So now, Son of Man... Take up a lamentation unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou, king of Tyrus, thou sealest up the sum. In other words, you're, like, you're, you're the man. You're full of wisdom, and you are perfect in beauty. Thou, Tyrus, hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Okay, really? You mean Tyrus was in the Garden of God, in, in the Garden of Eden? Well, I, I would have to ask a question about that, because what we have here is Tyrus existing in life. To us, it's history, but at his time, he was many years after the flood. Is that fair to say? So it, the Garden of God, Eden, had been destroyed by the flood. Is that also fair to say? So how is it that the king of Tyrus had been in Eden? The reason why, it's because the king of Tyrus is symbolic of somebody who had been in Eden. You with me? Okay, so let's read that again. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets, of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So according to this scripture, there's somebody who had been in the Garden of Eden, the Garden of God, and every precious stone was his covering. Who is this? It was Lucifer. Notice what it says in verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth and I have set thee so, God says. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, 
which is in heaven, not there in Eden, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. It says there in verse 15, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was where? Found in thee. So Lucifer in the very city of God, on the mountain of God, dwelling in the flames of fire. We know that our God is a consuming fire, right? Dwelling there, it says iniquity was found in him. Well, now I had already explained a little bit before where he was a son by creation. And he was jealous of the son that was begotten. Because the son begotten was receiving worship and the son created was not. And so he thought, wait a minute, I should be getting worship too. He wanted to be like the Most High. We can see that in a bit in the book of Isaiah. But let's go first to a book. If you haven't read, you ought to read this book. This is actually the first sentence of this book. And I'll tell you, this book has done a great work it's actually a series of articles that are put together, so it's not really like a compilation necessarily, except it's um, that series that's been compiled. So it's not necessarily a compilation like some of the compilations are from this author, but you'll find in the, the very first sentence in Story of Redemption, if you haven't read that, you ought to read it. It goes through the, the history of the angels better than a lot of other books do. So just check that out sometime. Here's the phrase. Lucifer, the very first sentence of that book, in heaven, before his rebellion, was a high and exalted angel, next in honor to God's dear son. Wait a minute, next in honor to God's dear son? That was kind of interesting how we heard that cheering at that point. It was good call. Yeah, it was. You know, we can say that of Lucifer next in honor, like, praise the Lord, that's great, except the problem is, Lucifer was, like we le just learned about in Ezekiel, he had iniquity found in him. And so the praise that we just heard should be boo, right? I mean, like, that's, it was kind of an awkward timing, but we understand how things work. Anyways, this being, Lucifer, he was next in honor to God's dear son, who is, according to the Bible now, who is the highest in heaven? The Father. the Father. Who is next to the Father in honor, power, strength, and all those other things? Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, right? So here, this author says that Lucifer was next in honor to God's dear Son. Now, I want to go a little bit further and find something in another book that if you have not read, you have got to. Even more than the story of redemption, you ought to read this next book. <laughs> it's called The Great Controversy. Amen? Amen? How many have read that book? Oh, that book is amazing. Most of you have, praise the Lord. Sin originated with him who, next to Christ, had been most honored of God and who stood highest in, what is that next word? power and glory among the inhabitants of heaven. <laughs> Did she just say that sin originated with Lucifer? We know because we've already been going through that. It doesn't say it here, but in the context it does of this book. Sin originated with Satan, who next to Christ had been most honored and stood highest in power. Okay, so according to this quote, who is the third highest power in heaven? Lucifer. Lucifer. Now, does that mean that Lucifer is the Holy Spirit? No. no, 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 because we know that the same author says that the three highest powers in heaven, which I fully agree, are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Yes. But how could she say that? Ah, because if you understand what she says about angels, it fits in more than, better than a glove, okay? It fits in perfectly. What, what Lucifer was, and still is, but on the other side, is an agent. Did you hear what I said? Lucifer is an agent. 
And so he happened to be the highest agent of God next to his son. Does that make sense? So now, in the ministry of God, which is done through his Holy Spirit, the highest agent in that ministry of God through his Holy Spirit was Lucifer. That doesn't make Lucifer the Holy Spirit. It makes Lucifer the highest agent in the agency of the Holy Spirit. Now I said agency because you need to go and find this author in her writings and go and study the word agency, agencies, agents, and a thousand other things that include the angelic ministry. And you'll come away with a very similar understanding. She can say this because it's true. Lucifer was the highest power next to Christ. But that doesn't make him the Holy Spirit. I'm saying that because some people say that I say that. But it's not true. But I can say it because that's what it says, right? Lucifer was the third highest power in heaven, according to that. So let's go on here. It says, now, sin entered the world by the defection of one who stood at the head of the holy angels. That was Lucifer. What was it that wrought so great a change, transforming a royal, honored subject into an apostate? The answer is given, according to the Bible. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Had not the Lord, notice what it says here, had not the Lord made the covering cherub, which was Lucifer, so beautiful, so closely resembling his own image. Did you hear what that said? The Lord made the covering cherub so beautiful, so closely resembling his own image. Had not God awarded him special honor, had anything been left undone in the gift of beauty and power and honor, then Satan might have had some excuse. Had you ever read that one before? That's a good one. Oh, that's a good one. The reason why it's good is because it makes you able better, I think, to understand the issue between the Father, the Son, and the highest being next to the Son in honor and power, which was Lucifer. You see, <clears throat> because what we have is Lucifer looked so much like his creator. Who was his creator? God the Father through his Son, right? So, yes, we can say God the Father was his creator, but we can also say, yes, Jesus Christ the Son was his creator. And so, Lucifer was created so similarly to the Son, his creator, that's why he was jealous. Why is he receiving worship and I'm not? I've got all these beautiful gems on me, just like the high priest has in Exodus chapter 28. The high priest has all those beautiful um, topaz and onyx and sapphire and gold and carbuncle and all those beautiful gems, just like Lucifer did. Why? Because he was made so similarly in the creation. And that's why Lucifer thought he could be like the Most High, because he looked so much like the one that was like the Most High, which was the Son of God. Isn't that fascinating? I love this subject. So it says there in Isaiah 14, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? You were powerful, but look at you now, it says in verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars or other angels of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit, Isaiah says. So notice what it says. I, it doesn't say, I will be the Most High. What does it say? Like. 
I will be like the Most High. Why does he not say, I will be the Most High? Because he knew there was a difference between God the Father and the Son of God, whom he looked a lot like. So with his criteria, he wasn't able to say fairly, I will be God. Because he didn't have that prerogative. He couldn't just say, excuse me, God, step off the throne. But he, he thought that he could go up to the Son of God, whom he looked very much like. And he thought, you know what, step aside. I want to be like the Most High. You see how that works? So now there's a difference between the Father and the Son. How do I know that? I'll get my Bible and show you. The Bible teaches in John chapter 14, verse 28. John 14, verse 28. It says this. Right at the very end, my father is greater than I. Did you ever know that the Bible said that? My father is greater than I. Do you know that word greater has been translated many different ways. But in Romans chapter 9, when it's talking about Jacob and Esau, it says the elder shall serve the younger. And that word elder is the same identical word in the Greek to the word greater. So, when it says, my father is greater than I, you could translate that word to elder. My father is elder than I. That'll blow your mind if you haven't thought about that before. But you know, it's true. Amen? Amen. Amen. What do you mean he's, he's older? Well, the Bible does say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Doesn't it say that? The word begotten does not mean unique. The word only means unique. The only begotten son. See, the word begotten means brought forth. Just like Eve was brought forth from the side of Adam, Jesus Christ was brought forth from the Father. Adam and Eve, by the way, is an illustration of the, relation, the relationship between the Father and the Son. Amen. So now, notice what it says in Manuscript 86. Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And Lucifer, that glorious angel, got up a warfare over the matter until he had to be thrust down to the earth. Huh. Wow. Wow. So, Christ was the only begotten Son of God. When was this? This was during the time Lucifer had not yet been cast out. Because cast, Lucifer made a warfare over this matter. This was before Jesus had come to this earth to take on the persona of the Son of Man. You see, he had already been the Son of God. That's why the Bible says, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. Right? Because God had a son to give. It was his only begotten son. The unique begotten son. Or the only begotten son. By the way, that unique thing, if you didn't know this, you can find in... Now, let me see if I can remember the name. Kittle. That's his name. Kittle. Gerhard Kittle was Hitler's theologian. Adolf Hitler's theologian. And if you go and you, you find the phrase, just Google it, Hitler's theologian, you'll find that he wrote a Bible dictionary. And in that Bible dictionary, he was able to change the idea of the word begotten into this idea of unique. Because Hitler didn't like those that taught that Jesus Christ was actually begotten. They were referred to in the day as Arians. And so that's, it's not the same group that Hitler hated, but he didn't like the idea that Jesus was begotten. And so he had his theologian change that in this dictionary. And so guess what dictionary the Seventh-day Adventist Andrews University uses today? Hitler's. Hitler's theologian's dictionary. The dictionary by Gerhard Kittel. I believe it's K-I-T-T-L-E, Kittle. And so the, the reason why your pastor 
if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, or perhaps if you're not. The reason why your pastor has told you that the word begotten doesn't mean brought forth like born, but it really just means unique, is because Hitler has his fingers in the details. You see? Well, that's no fair, is it? I'd rather just stick with what the Bible teaches. And it's really hard to come up with the idea that the word begotten means unique. There, it, it means begotten, brought forth. It's really hard to get away from. So study your Bible, you'll find out. Now, what happens is this warfare is started because of this one being that was like the Most High or wanted to be like the Most High. Let me say it that way. And he was cast out. He was cast out down to the earth. And that's where Genesis chapter 3 comes in. Where Adam and Eve were walking along in the cool of the day. By the way, the word cool of the day is the second time the word spirit is used. By the way, if you didn't know that, you should check it out. Because you know where it says <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The very next time it's used is right there in Genesis 3 verse 8 where it says that the Lord was walking in the cool of the day in the wind, in the breeze. So if the Spirit of God was hovering over the earth and it's the breeze, it was his words. So that was the what in verse two. The Spirit of God, the breath, the, the breath of God, the words of God were hovering over the waters. Thank you, it's Christ the word, sure. And it also says how in the next verse. And God said, let there be light. So in verse 2, you're, you're learning about the how, or, or rather the what. And in verse 3, the very next sentence, the very next verse, the right there, it's the how. So the what of the Spirit hovering is the how of him speaking. Does that make sense? God created all things by saying, let the, beginning with saying, let there be light. So that's Genesis chapter 3. The cool of the day, the Lord comes to visit Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had chosen to follow this other spirit. You see, because there was only, prior to this rebellion of, of Lucifer, there was only one spirit in the universe. Only one. It was the spirit of holiness. Did you have a question? No. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Okay. It was the spirit of holiness. Now, when Satan realized he wasn't getting worship, and he wanted worship, he ended up becoming proud and jealous, and he started looking towards self. That's very contrary to the spirit of holiness. And so what happened is, there ended up being another spirit in the universe. It was the spirit contrary to the spirit of God. So now there are two spirits in the universe. One was cast out along with its inhabitants, which was Lucifer and, and about a third of the angels, according to Revelation chapter 12. And so that spirit was not any longer in heaven, it was down here on the earth. And that spirit was seducing enough to trick Eve. How? Through the medium of the serpent. Satan uses vessels or mediums or channels or agents, just like God does. God uses agents. One of his agents is his word. And right here, you have his word. And by the way, the Bible says in John chapter 6, 63, his word is spirit and life. How is it spirit? Because God uses it as a channel for his will, his mind, his thoughts, his character, his life. And so the word is spirit. It doesn't mean it's some disembodied floating something. No, it's an actual object. But it is the mind of God on paper. It's the spirit, the will, the character, the life of God on paper. That's how it's the spirit. Some people get really crazy with that idea. You say the word is spirit and they think you're saying something spiritualistic. No, it's not spiritualistic at all. It makes perfect sense. It's God's mind on paper. It's his will, his desires, his life, his character, his thoughts, his personality. It's his spirit on paper, written down through the prophets, which by the way, are vessels, channels, tools, agents. So, Genesis 3, you see this serpent, he actually is used by the devil as a channel or a serpent, a, um, I'm sorry, a medium or an agent. And as a result, Eve is deceived. 
And Adam then chooses to follow Eve instead of trusting God to provide another woman in the place of Eve. Some of the women are like, oh, that's true love, right? Actually, it was deception. It was terrible. That's why you're still tasting that bit of fruit that was eaten that day. And we'll taste it until Jesus comes to take us back to heaven. Notice what it says here. The reason why the churches today are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy, this Lucifer, that became Satan has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the, what's the next word? Comforter, not as a comforter, but as the comforter. So he has sought to shut Jesus from their view as the comforter. It says there in the next part, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes them saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. That's, by the way, it's Christ that says that. Christ has all power in heaven and in earth, and he can strengthen the wavering and set right the erring. How does he do it? Through his agent, the word. He also does it through his agents, the angels. He does it through agents like you as well. That's how God says this is the way, walk ye in it. It's not a disembodied spirit. He can inspire with confidence, with hope in God. And confidence in God always results in creating confidence in one another. And so this is why today we have such weak and sickly churches. Thank you, dear brother. I appreciate that. So the reason why the enemy has brought in a discouraging nature into the church is because he has sought to shut out Christ as the comforter. You don't have to go very far in John 14 to learn that the Comforter is the Spirit of Christ. That's why in verse 17 it says it's the Spirit of Truth. Who is Truth? Everybody say it at one time. Who is it? Jesus. Thank you, it's Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, if it's the Spirit of Truth, then we're talking about the Spirit of Jesus. It's the Truth's Spirit. It's Jesus' Spirit. And that's why in verse 18 of John chapter 14, it says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So if Christ does not leave us comfortless, he leaves us comforted. So the enemy has shot to, uh, sought rather to shut out Christ from being known as the comforter. And so <clears throat> what happens is, if Christ isn't there, somebody's got to fill that spot. Who do you think it would be? Lucifer. Lucifer. He comes in there and he says, oh, I'll take this place. No problem. In fact, Lucifer wanted to be the third in the councils that were between them both. And he couldn't be there. So now, guess what he is? He's the third in the councils between them three in a false doctrine. Yes, sir. Exactly. The comment is good. I'll, I'll uh, rehearse it briefly. It's important for us to know and understand the sanctuary, including even the furniture, knowing that the table of showbread, which has two stacks of bread on it, each having six, is representing, I'm going to throw in a little something, the throne of God. And Lucifer knew that toward the sides of the north, which is where the table of showbread was, people would be looking to see God. And so if you have Lucifer in the councils between them both, you actually have three stacks instead of two. What does that mean? Six, six, six. That's not a good thing, right? So we have a false God, a false system, false understanding when we have Lucifer in that council between them both. And it's not a good thing. So, yes, and I appreciate the sanctuary. I love the sanctuary. In fact, since studying the angels, I realize the angels are all over the sanctuary. That's an amazing study. James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, You believe that there is one God, and you do well, because there is one God. The devils also believe that there's one God, and they tremble. But one of the things they don't have is a correct belief. They know he exists, but that doesn't give them a good relationship. In fact, they do have a relationship with God, but not a saving relationship. You see the difference? 
So what we do have, though, is John 17, verse 3, where Jesus, when he was in prayer, he said, This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You see, but Satan, he believes, but he doesn't have that knowledge which is saving. He doesn't have that knowledge which is knowing intimately and being in more in a surrendering way, knowing the Father and His Son. So the devils believe there's only one true God. Jesus believes there's only one true God. But there's a whole lot of people today that don't believe there's only one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. They, they think it's like a three and one and one and three thing. And that doesn't work biblically. I'm not making fun of it. I'm just telling you, it doesn't work. Actually, I should make fun of it because it's not a good doctrine. It's a bad one. You just need to know that. Three and one and one and three is not biblical. In fact, it's satanic. Jude verse, chapter one, which is only one chapter, verse nine. Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil... He disputed about the body of Moses. He durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. So how did, in the story of Moses' body being dealt with, we see that Moses was transported to heaven. He must have been resurrected here, as it's described in Jude, because we see Moses there on the mount, right? Moses and Elijah were there. And it, symbolic, it was symbolic, as was mentioned, of the transfiguration, which is the saints resurrected before uh, or during the time Christ comes. And so, <clears throat> let's see here. Michael did not contend with the devil in a disputing way, but frankly stated, the Lord rebuked thee. It was God's words that were used to defeat the enemy. And even in the, gar the wilderness of temptation, which you find in Matthew chapter 4, right? Yeah, Matthew chapter 4. You find that the enemy simply was defeated by the words of God. Remember, there were three times Christ said, it is written, right? And each of those three times, by the way, Christ quoted from the time when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. He was in the wilderness, and he quoted three times from Deuteronomy. So now this Michael character, who is Michael? Let's just find out very, very briefly. There's a lot you can study on this, but the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So this is saying that the Lord himself will descend with the voice of the archangel. He doesn't borrow somebody else's voice, he's using his own, yes. right? So the next verse says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Revelation 12, 7 describes more about this Michael character. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So this is now where Christ and Satan warred in heaven, and Satan was cast out. Now, what is important here is that it was Michael that was referred to as the one that cast out the devil. And we know that to be Christ, right? The Son of God. So according to the scripture, Michael is Jesus Christ. Amen. The word Michael simply means one who is like God. And Lucifer wanted to be like God. So now notice what it says in Zechariah 6, 11 through, or, uh, yeah, 11 through 13. Take silver and gold and make crowns. This is a prophecy, by the way. And set them upon the head of Joshua. Who's Joshua? He's the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, Joshua, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, which we know is Jesus Christ. You can see that in other scriptures. 
He shall grow up out of his place and shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he, Christ, shall bear the glory. That's the Father's glory. And by the way, it's the Father's temple as well. And he shall sit and rule upon his Father's throne. And he shall be a priest upon his Father's throne. And the council of his Father's peace, or the Father's council of peace, shall be between them both, he and his Father. This is where the enemy wanted to come in and be part of the councils which were between them both. But you see, that was not something that was in God's plan. It was only the Father and His Son. No other being in all the universe, according to the 29th chapter of the Great Controversy, could enter into those councils. Notice what it says in Great Controversy. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being in all the universe that could enter into the counsels and purposes of God. So, how many beings were in the counsels of God? Two, that's it. There were not three. There was only two, the Father and His Son. Well, does that mean that the Holy Spirit wasn't there? No, it means the Holy Spirit was there. It's not a separate being. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Just like I have a spirit, and if I'm scared, my spirit is scared, meaning my mind is scared. And just like if you were angry, your spirit would be angry or troubled. That means your mind is angry or troubled. In the same way, God the Father has a spirit, and the Son has a spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is definitely each of their spirit, because they each have holiness. But the Holy Spirit that you partake of when you surrender, when you confess, when you forsake your sins, it's the Spirit of Christ, but it's also the Spirit of the Father and the Son together. It's one Spirit. It's not, I get Christ's Spirit, but not the Father's Spirit. It's not like that. It's one Spirit generally that you partake of. Or you choose the other Spirit generally, which is the enemy Spirit. There are only two Spirits in the world. We each have our own individual Spirit, but the Holy Spirit that you become partaker of when you surrender yourself to the Lord, forsaking your sins, is the general Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? We don't have a whole bunch of little spirits running around that are Holy Spirits. So, notice what the Bible teaches in this story. I'm going to read through it quickly and then we'll understand a little bit. In all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. He was praised and beautiful. Kind of like Lucifer. It came to pass after this that Absalom prepared his chariots and his horses and 50 men to run before him. So he gathered a crowd around him, kind of like Lucifer. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. The gate is the entrance to the city, of course. And it was so that when any man that had any controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom came unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, well, thy servant is of the, one of the tribes of Israel, whether he be from Judah or <clears throat> Asher or some other. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but ah, there's no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said moreover, Well, oh, that I were made judge of the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. Sounds like Lucifer trying to be deceitful, trying to get people on his side. In the midst of this war over the sun, who is the sun that should be worshipped, this Absalom wanted to be in the place of the king, the king that was worshipped. Now notice as we continue. It was so that when any man came nigh unto him to do him obeisance, that means to worship, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. 
And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. And Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And it says, and the people increased continually with Absalom. If you read the rest of the story, you'll understand that there was war in the camp because this young son, kind of like Lucifer was a young son, he was trying to get the throne. And as a result of this young son trying to get the throne, there was war. And Absalom ended up not doing so well. Lucifer will end up not doing so well. We should not follow Lucifer or Satan. We should follow God and his son. So we turn our lives over to the Father. We turn our lives over to the Son because look at all the world today is wandering after the beast, according to Revelation 13, verse 3. All the world. By the way, in the Garden of Eden, when Lucifer showed up as a serpent, could you call the serpent a beast? Some kind of animal or a critter, some sort, you know, right? Well, when Eve listened to the serpent and then Adam listened to Eve, all the world wandered after the beast. Same story, all the way from Genesis. It's been all the way through the history of God's people. The world has wandered after the beast. And guess what? Today, in such a way that is startling, the world is wandering after the beast. How so? Frankly, it is through doctrine, through teaching, through the seductive words of the one woman who's deceived, just like Eve, and the one who's supposed to stand as the head of the family, as the leader, as the priest of the home, he ends up listening to the words of a deceived woman contrary to the words of God. And he follows the beast. All the world was wondering after the beast in the story of Adam and Eve. And it's happened again today. We must not surrender to the will of the enemy. We must surrender to the will of God. Where do we find the will of God? Right here in his holy word. This is where to find the truth. Now today we're living in a time where <clears throat> the world is falling apart around us. It says angels were expelled from heaven because they would not work in harmony with God. They fell from their high estate because they wanted to be exalted. They had come to exalt themselves and they forgot that their beauty of person and of character came from the Lord Jesus. This fact the angels would obscure that Christ was the only begotten Son of God. And guess what? That fact is still being obscured today. Just ask Hitler's theologian. And they came to consider that they were not to consult Christ any longer. One angel began the controversy and carried it on until there was rebellion in the heavenly courts among the angels. They were lifted up because of their beauty. They chose not to know and love the Father and His Son. But we today have been called contrary to that obscured teaching. We need to understand what Jesus was praying. This is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, Jesus said about His Father, and, speaking of Himself in the third person, Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. So this is the call for today. In the theology and confusion and teachings and all of the voices of the serpents around the world, we must stick to the Bible. We cannot fall short. Somebody was saying to me today, just a few minutes before we started, we really believe Jesus Christ is coming soon. I really believe we are at the end of time. We do not have much longer. Yes. And if we're not studying the Bible for ourselves regularly, habitually, if this is something that we just get on the weekends or perhaps through 3ABN or something like that, some YouTube channel, we are not partaking of the life of God, the Spirit of God for ourselves. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. And so we must, we must study the Bibles for ourselves. Because the enemy is going about as a roaring lion. But there is the lion of the tribe of Judah who's also roaring loudly today. Amen. Come out of her, my people. And I'm telling you, we must listen to the correct voice. Amen?
We're at a time where <clears throat> Satan, he works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature and he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. Just find out about that regarding the book of Job. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, and children were swept away. One trouble succeeded another as in a moment. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them from the power of the destroyer. You can read that in Psalm 91. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord would do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. And he doesn't protect those that don't ask. He will favor and prosper some, the devil will, in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them from the great controversy, while appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies. He will bring disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work. You've seen the news, haven't you? In accidents, calamities, by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, which is fires, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint. Just look at Los Angeles, where, near where I'm from. And thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the Bible says. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws. They have changed the ordinance and broken the everlasting covenant. Taken from the Great Controversy 589. Now, one more thought. And then the great deceiver, after all those things have happened, will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. Yes. We must understand that Lucifer has fallen. He is now Satan, and he is not our friend. Amen. We do have a forever friend. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. And what does he do? He brings us to his Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right? So the ultimate goal is to be in heaven with the Father, to actually replace the fallen angels with humanity. And I want to be there. What about you? Amen. I choose today to study God's word to know what it is that he's asked me to know in preparation for Christ's soon coming. The Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth. I submit to it today, and I want you to do the same thing. Will you follow on to know the Lord with me? Will you study the Bible for yourself? Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, it's good to be alive. It's good to be here. It's good to be together. We're thanking you for the opportunity to learn a little bit more about what happened in heaven during the time that Lucifer became jealous of your son and was cast out along with a third of the angels. We thank you, Lord, that even though Adam and Eve were deceived and fell, chose sin and the, the spirit that's in this world. We have hope in your son. He has come to live and was victorious over that spirit. He chose your spirit, not even his own will, but thine be done. And we ask for your grace to have the same power in our lives. Please, Lord, help us to continue to study and learn to understand what it is that the spirit is saying to the churches, the Holy Spirit that we can know your mind, your will, your character, your life, your purposes for us. I pray you'd guide and bless us. Thank you for this opportunity to study together and guide us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.